is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. I have not given up hope that there is still a path towards um, an end to the violence, but we need to prepare for the very real possibility that Sudan is about to descend into all-out civil war. My concern is that this may quickly become a proxy war. That's Chris Coons, a member of the U.S. Senate's Foreign Relations Committee, on concerns that the worst may be yet to come in Sudan's conflict. Details coming up also. Forbes Africa announces its famous 30 under 30 list of African innovators. And Tanzania signs a deal over $600 million to mine rare earth minerals and graphite. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Fighting raged in the Sudanese capital of Khartoum today after the warring parties locked in a power struggle failed to uphold an overnight ceasefire. Doctors say five days of clashes between Sudan's armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces have left nearly 300 people dead and more than 2,000 injured. The Rapid Support Force has announced another 24-hour ceasefire for late today. However, the military has not yet responded. Michael Atit reports for VOA. Fighting could be heard throughout the night in Khartoum and into Wednesday, despite both sides agreeing that a 24-hour ceasefire could restart overnight. Sudan's Ministry of Health Emergency Operations Center said the clashes between the military and rapid support forces left 270 people dead and 2,600 injured across the country. The ongoing fighting makes it impossible for VOA to verify casualty figures. Most of the casualties are in Khartoum, where the fighting has stopped essential services like power and water and forced most hospitals to close. Thousands of Khartoum residents are fleeing into suburbs or even further. He's speaking to VOA Wednesday, a man who called himself Murtada said he and his wife were leaving for Kasala in eastern Sudan. He said Sudanese leaders had an opportunity to rebuild the country but were instead destroying it. <laughs> Murtada says they had a very poor economy and an opportunity to rebuild that and provide citizens with basic needs. We are now traveling, he says, adding, even though we are scared because we don't know how the situation along the road. His wife, Manal Hassan, tells VOA she is surprised to see Sudanese killing each other. She blames the warring generals, RSF leader Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, known as Himeti, and Sudan's military leader, Abdul Fattah al-Burhan. <laughs> I want to tell Himeti and Al-Burhan to come to their senses and stop the fighting immediately, says Hassan. She says the victims from both sides are Sudanese. Hassan says both leaders are fighting for power. This is not an external attack on the country, she says, and asks, why do we kill ourselves? Khartoum resident Ahmed al-Sudani says the clashes have stopped his business of selling aluminium and that he can no longer provide for his family of six. He tells VOA they are fleeing to neighboring Al Jazeera state in the southeast because the situation is becoming worse. Sudan says the ongoing fighting is strong from both sides. He says, we are supposed to put our hands together to build this country. Haj Hamad is a lecturer at Sudanese Center for African and Asian Studies in Khartoum. He tells VOA the ceasefire could not hold because both parties were trying to control strategic areas and gain more territory before any dialogue. The area of, uh, of fighting is uh, sovereign in institutions. We call it uh, the sovereign area, which is a uh, military command headquarters and uh, the Khartoum airport and the palace. Uh, these are uh, kind of institutions. The Rapid Support Forces announced Wednesday afternoon they had agreed to another 24-hour ceasefire from 6 p.m. Khartoum's time. It wasn't immediately clear if Sudan's army had agreed to the throws or if this latest attempt is to the battle chance of holding. Michael Atid, for VOA News, Khartoum, Sudan. 
International groups have halted humanitarian aid as gunfire and shelling continues in the capital Khartoum and in other Sudanese towns. Thomas Okedi is an aid worker with the Norwegian Refugee Council who has been trapped in northern Darfur for the past five days. He tells VOA's Carol Van Dam six of his colleagues risked leaving their neighborhoods where the fighting was more intense to join him. Imagine they had to walk two kilometers, they had to walk one kilometer with bullets flying over them just for them to be able to move to a location they they considered safe. And there are so many people within the city who are making those type of movements. I am in touch with my staff on uh, every day in the morning just to find out how they are doing as part of staff well-being. And many of them told me they had to leave their houses and move into other neighborhoods they considered secure. Some of them, uh, some of the neighborhoods, Neighborhoods have been massively looted, so it's it's worrying. It's worrying. What is your plan? What do you, do you guys have like a group plan of what you're going to do? Are are you planning to just stay in place as long as you can, shelter in? Right now, it is really about short-term survival needs. So our plan number one first is safety and safety and safety, ensuring that we are as safe as we can, inshallah, as they say in the Muslim world. But also number two just to ensure that we can be able to keep ourselves afloat and, you know, eat whatever basic food we can be able to eat so that we can be able to see the next day. So we do not have medium or long-term plans at the moment. Right now it's about safety, number one, and number two, about survival. And that is what is happening for all the communities in El Fasha City. And that is Thomas Okedi, an aid worker with the Norwegian Refugee Council. He was speaking with uh, Carol Van Dam from Northern Darfur, Sudan. As fighting in Sudan continues with truces ending before the ink is dry, UN Representative Volker Perthius is engaging with rivals General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo and other key players to secure a ceasefire. However, with no apparent successful mediation to end the fighting, Joseph Siegel, Director of Research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies, discussed end-game scenarios with VOA Senior Analyst Mohamed El Shanawi. For now, I see three possible scenarios. One is that there's battle fatigue, that each side realizes that they're taking losses, that this is extremely dangerous for their interest, as well as for the country. And They'll, they'll take an opportunity for a cooling down period and some ceasefire and then some outside mediation led by the civilians and international actors that can restore some sort of order and move the process forward towards negotiations. I think a second scenario is that one side is victorious, that they are able to break the supply lines and chain of command that they seize enough assets of the other side that one side disintegrates as as a functioning force. And, you know, with that, you would have a a unified voice within the military, which would then need to negotiate with civilians about how the process of transition to civilian government is going to work and the role of the military under that arrangement. You know, I think under the scenario two, with one side vanquishing the other, you know, there's going to be also the issue of how do you integrate the tens of thousands of, of troops from the rival camp, either into the military or into other aspects of, of the economy, so that you don't have uh, an ongoing risk of these fighters becoming organized criminal syndicates and threatening the country that way? I think a third scenario is a negotiated settlement out where neither side wins and we're looking at a more prolonged conflict. And so, you know, through negotiation that there's a a mediation such that both Burhan and Hemeti agree to leave the country and they are forced into some sort of exile arrangement. And by, you know, removing the politicized actors within the military, then it provides a, a clean slate for the military to uh, reconstitute itself and work with civilian actors and moving forward with the transition that has been on the negotiating table. Are you optimistic that Dagalo will leave the mining and leave the country? I think uh, in both cases, in case of Hemeti and with Burhan, there have been economic incentives, there have been economic economic interest that have allowed them to profit financially from their role. That's one of the dysfunctions of the current arrangement where the military controls so much of the economy. And so 
as part of that negotiation, and in fact, this has been part of the negotiations for a democratic transition, these interests are going to have to be brought under control of the government. And so I think, you know, the suggestion that both sides would go into exile you know, would be the recognition that uh, neither side sees in existence, sees their continued viability in the country. So they would, you know, as part of the negotiation and with the support of some uh, third party international actor, would find a comfortable off ramp, comfortable a way that they could transition into a retirement where they would be safe and 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 have uh, sufficient resources to meet their their needs and, and needs of the family without pillaging the resources that uh, they may have gained through through the exploitation of uh, Sudan's economy over the years. That was Joseph Siegel, director of research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, speaking with VOA's Mohammed Al Shanawi. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Officials in Cameroon's northern border with Nigeria say Boko Haram militants in the past week destroyed hundreds of homes and large attacks that killed at least six villagers and two soldiers and left thousands homeless. Cameroon's government says troops retaliated Wednesday morning and killed at least 12 militants. Moki Edwin Kindeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Officials in Cameroon's Mayo Moscota district on the border with Nigeria's Bono state say hundreds of Boko Haram fighters launched deadly attacks on villages over the past five days. Cameroon's military says six civilians and two government troops were killed in the attacks and the militants stole two military jeeps and some ammunition. Gejo Salomon is Cameroon's official in charge of agriculture in Mayo where he spoke by phone Wednesday to VOA. He says the militants looted markets, ranches, farms and shops and sent villagers fleeing for safety. Salomon says thousands of civilians are hiding in the bush on the border with Nigeria and neighboring towns including Mokolo, Moskota, and Koza. He says on Monday, the militants destroyed close to 400 shops and houses. Salomon says the militants crossed the border to Nigeria with stolen loot, including about 200 cows, more than 250 goats and sheep, and 100 motorcycles. Salomon says Cameroon's military chased the militants back across Nigeria's border into Borno State, the best place of Boko Haram. Cameroon's government says at least 12 militants were killed on Wednesday morning in a military raid on its side of the border. VOA could not independently verify the number of casualties, but witnesses confirmed the attacks involved hundreds of militants. The governor of Cameroon's far north region, Midjiyawa Bakari, spoke to VOA via a messaging app. Bakari says Cameroon's military has been deployed to protect civilians on the border with Nigeria who are again suffering because of fresh Boko Haram incursions. He says besides fighting the insurgents, troops will provide first aid to wounded civilians and work with local militias who have a mastery of roads used by the militants to enter Cameroon through the porous border. Villagers are calling on troops to better protect them from the militants. Cameroon's military said Tuesday the multinational joint task force of the Lake Chad Basin Commission met in Mora, a northern border town with Chad and Nigeria. The task force, made up of troops from Cameroon, Chad, Niger and Nigeria, discussed how to stop the attacks. Cameroon in March said at least 3,000 people were displaced in fighting along Nigerian border towns and villages, including Mayo Moskota. Cameroon's government repeated calls for villagers to report any strangers in their villages and said it remobilized militias to assist troops fighting Boko Haram. Boko Haram attacks began in Nigeria's Borno state in 2009 before spreading to neighboring countries, including Cameroon, Chad, and Nigeria. 
The United Nations says the Islamist insurgency has left more than 36,000 people dead, mainly in Nigeria, and 3 million displaced. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. Tanzania has signed agreements worth $667 million with three Australian companies to mine rare earth minerals and graphite. Rare earths are a group of 17 minerals used in consumer electronics, electric vehicles, smartphones, renewable energy and military equipment. Chadema is the second largest political party in Tanzania. John Marema is Chadema's Protocol Communications and Foreign Affairs Director. He tells VOA's Douglas Mpuga that some people are concerned because the agreement with the Australian companies has not been made public. As usual, the government doesn't want to make those contracts public so that the public can have a scrutiny on it. So we don't know exactly what is within those contracts. The only thing we know is that Yesterday, the government signed this several contract. That's all. But the detail about what is inside those contracts, nobody knows, other than the government itself. Even the members of the parliament, they don't know what is inside those contracts. The government is working as it has been doing since 1990s, signing these contracts, although they do appear in public, showing that they are signing, but... They doesn't want the public to know exactly what is inside those contracts. So that's my first general comment, that the government has continued working like it was working since 1990s. Uh, these contracts uh, involve uh, exp- exploiting minerals. Uh, that takes a long, a long time. So shouldn't the people know what in, is in the, in the deal? Not only the people, even the members of the parliament who are the representatives of the people, they don't know what is inside those contracts because... These contracts are not public. Even for the committee members of the House of Parliament who are involved in minerals affairs, they are not given a copy of those contracts. So the government negotiated with these multinationals in shadows, and they come up and they sign contracts. What, what they do tell us always is that these contracts are good for the country, these contracts will benefit the country, but when they start extracting these minerals. That's when the public realized that, oh, these contracts are not good because the public is not benefiting from it. So we need the government to be transparent, to, to make sure that the public knows what is inside of these contracts. Members of parliament who are the representatives of the public should, should have the right to know exactly what the government has signed on behalf of the Tanzanian public. Another crucial issue that many analysts uh, point out as, reg- as far as uh, mining is concerned are environmental issues. That is another area which is very, very big. We have seen these environmental issues, how people have been affected in several mining areas from the, the ones owned by the Barrick Gold, the International Barrick Gold, in Mongo Tarime, how people have been affected, how River Mara has been affected by various chemicals which are coming from these uh, minings. We've seen this in the uh, Bulianghul mining and several other, other areas. So on the issues of environmental, if the government has gone through environmental impact assessment before signing this contract, we have a law which says that before signing an, 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 an mining contract, before starting of extraction, they, they, they should conduct the environmental impact assessment. But who conducts this environmental impact, impact assessment? It is the government agents. Who is sure that they did conduct environmental impact assessment? Because we don't have an independent body to conduct this environmental impact assessment. And even the reports are not public. Under our laws, the National Environmental Management Team is the one responsible for conducting the environmental impact assessment. But we are not sure because we have never seen the report their report on the environmental impact assessment before the signing of this contract. So yeah, we are appealing to the government again that they should make these things public so that even the public can scrutinize, can advise, and can make a follow-up. They should have a prior informed consent of the people who are in those areas before signing these contracts. 
the government, they do sign the contracts, and then they, they start evacuating people. And those who remain around those mining, they, they are not even aware of the, the dangers they are going to be exposed to because of these acids which are used in, in, in mining activities and several other impacts they are going to get in their lives. That was John Merema, the communication director of Chadema's party. He spoke to Douglas Mpuga from Dar es Salaam. Forbes, Africa Business Magazine, recently announced its famous 30 under 30 list of African innovators. The magazine says this year's crop of excellence includes young achievers who build solutions-oriented businesses from scratch. Darren Taylor reports. When Dr. Wedu Somalakai announced she was opening Botswana's first medical aesthetics practice in Gaborone a few years ago, few in the southern African nation knew what she was speaking about. Medical aesthetics is a field in modern medicine aimed at altering patients' cosmetic appearance. Procedures that Somalakai and her team at Mediglow Aesthetics do include removing scars, wrinkles, moles, excess fat and unwanted hair. Aesthetic medicine is a relatively new industry in Botswana especially, but even on the continent. And so getting the recognition will spark a lot of curiosity in people and hopefully get them interested in the kind of services that we offer and hopefully bring in more clients for the clinic. Africans who want cosmetic surgery usually have to travel to developed countries to get it, but Somalakai's service now means they're able to receive it at home. In Nigeria, Blessing Abeng's company, Ingressive for Good, is equipping West African youth with the tech skills they need to build their own businesses and to get jobs. So far, we've trained about 132,000 people, training them in tech skills, and placed thousands in jobs. So getting this recognition has been really inspiring, but even more for people in my industry and people in tech. Most of the people who were responding and saying congratulations also sort of felt like the life that they want is possible and has inspired them to come take courses we currently have a scholarship, the Cyber Security Scholarship in partnership with Cisco, and the um, application for that has really, really soared. Lesotho's Kuala Manoheng is director of Kansai Energy. We have been the ones we've been waiting for for years now, and this recognition really allows us to take charge. His company provides solar power to rural communities throughout the tiny mountain kingdom, giving them electricity which they otherwise wouldn't have. Manoeng says the Forbes Award is unexpected, but very welcome. One thing for me that's really important is going back home. And this really gives us an opportunity to spotlight, you know, the plight of energy poverty in Lesotho and energy access, work that we've actually been doing. When it comes to other focus areas such as climate change awareness, you know, really bringing it into the social dialogue, bringing it closer to people who necessarily don't understand what we're dealing with here. For me, coming from a least developed country like Lesotho and being the first under 30 from Lesotho, it's actually very affirming, but it also opens up doors for others. You know, I don't walk this path by myself. Abeng's advice to young African innovators is to start businesses slowly and with humility. Most times we overestimate what we can do in a day and underestimate what we can do in a year. It's not enough to show the work. You have to do both. You have to do the work and show the work. You have to show the results. But most importantly, do one thing every day to be better and bring you closer to your goals. The results will always speak for you. Ask for help when you need it. When you find a problem that is worth solving, go right ahead and solve it. The only way that you learn is by experimenting. All three entrepreneurs say they had to make many mistakes before they found a recipe for success. As Manoeng puts it, it takes bravery to bounce back from failure. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer, Mokwilia Barrow, and our engineer, Helen Cordian, thanks for choosing the Voice of America. <laughs>